That's all I want to say. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. Yes, children, we are out of 1 Corinthians 14 and have moved into chapter 15, one of the greatest chapters in all of the Scripture. It's on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I want us to begin. We're just going to begin unpacking it today. We will not make it through these 11 verses. We're going to begin doing that. Stand with me if you would. If you found this in your Bible, if you don't have a Bible, we're going to put the text on the screen for you so that you can read it. I can't say this too many times. We don't want you to ever sit and just hear some preacher saying what he thinks something says about something. The Word of God is true. It is, it is piercing like a double-edged sword. We want the Word of God before our people. If you don't have a Bible and you want one, see me. We will make arrangements to get you your own copy of the Scriptures. Follow along as I read. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, that is Peter, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. We want to hear it today and begin to take in and digest this, this wonderful synopsis of the Gospel. To consider what's at stake here. A Corinthian church that believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but it had been brought to doubt they themselves and others like them would experience resurrection. May the Lord help us make our way through this and grow in our appreciation for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, this chapter is devoted almost entirely to doctrine. Uh, it's not like some of the other things where Paul has been addressing ish specific issues. There is a specific issue in view here, but he is, he is challenging it. He is correcting it with a clear doctrine of the resurrection. These 58 verses give us the most extensive treatment of the resurrection in all of Scripture. Our hope is here. If there is no resurrection, Joshua said it earlier, the text says it here, we have no hope. People shouldn't look at us with envy. They should look at us with pity because we've put our hope, put all our eggs in a basket. It's not going to come through for us. One fellow said that the heart gives life giving blood pumping to every part of the body. The truth of the resurrection gives life to every area of the gospel, of gospel truth. The whole of Christianity hinges and turns on the resurrection, not only of Jesus Christ, that's the saving door, but the resurrection of those who have followed Jesus Christ. Without the resurrection, we're all just engaged here in wishful thinking, a fantasy, a myth, a feel-good story. No, our text is going to tell us as we move down through chapter 15, but he is indeed risen because of that. The one who said, because I live, you too shall live, gives us hope, not only in this life, but in the life that is to come. If you study the teachings of Jesus, the resurrection is the focal point of everything else he taught. You'll remember when we went through Mark's gospel, we cited these, these just real quickly. Chapter 8, verse 31, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things. There's the cross be rejected by the elders and the chief priests, scribes, and be killed, 
and after three days rise again. In chapter 9 of Mark, verse 9, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Chapter 9, verse 31. He was teaching his disciples, saying, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. And then in John's Gospel, where he declared himself in the, in the context of the death of Lazarus, one of his dearest friends, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. When we come to Pentecost, in the aftermath of Pentecost, the, gospel, the sermons preached, the first two sermons preached, and we won't go through those, I would just commend to you Acts 2, 14 to 36, Acts 3, 12 to 26, that they're both centered on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was the message of the apostles. It was the truth. It was the foundation stone upon which the whole hope of the gospel and Christianity itself built. There was a British philosopher, John Locke, in the 18th century, who said, Our Savior's resurrection is truly of great importance in Christianity, so great that his being or not being the Messiah stands or falls on it, that is the resurrection. Well, it shouldn't surprise us with this, with this criticality of the resurrection that it is the focal point of the assault of the devil. He's done everything he can, even at the point where, where Jesus was placed in the sepulcher and was clearly raised from the dead three days later. The devil incited the Romans. He incited the Jewish religious leaders who began to spread myths that he wasn't really dead when he was on the cross. He had only swooned and had, had been revived in the aftermath of that. Or that his body was stolen away by the disciples. Or that they'd gone to the wrong tomb. All these lies have been perpetrated. We're going to come into Easter and celebrate Resurrection Sunday uh, that we do in an annual way. Though truly, every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. And look again at this, at this wonderful, blessed hope. But the devil assaults this doctrine. He plants doubts in the minds of people. And apparently the Corinthians had experienced some of this. As, as one commentator said, when you read through the passage, they're not denying the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What they're denying is that because of the resurrection of Christ that they rise. We see this argument play out here. Paul would say, as we read earlier together and responsibly in verse 19, if we, if we have hope in this life only, in other words, if there's no hope beyond the grave, then pity us. Pity us more than you would pity anyone else. Paul said it this way in Romans chapter 10 when he was exhorting them that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He comes to declare in verse 9, he says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And if you follow on in that passage, he says, For... It's with the heart that a person believes and is justified. Notice what he does there. When we studied this passage some time ago, he inverts the order. First thing he says is what we call, we call upon sinners. Confess with your mouth. Jesus is Lord. And make that confession coming from a heart that believes that he died and rose again. That's, that's our call. That's what we place to you every Sunday, what you place to others when you witness to them during the week. But he goes on and says, For... It is with a heart that a person believes and is justified. That's where it happens first. And it's expressed, but it comes out of the mouth that confession is made into salvation. So it's the, the core of it, the center of it. You cannot be a Christian and not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you will not be a happy, hopeful, fruitful Christian if you do not believe that you will follow him in resurrection. You will live fretful. You will live doubtful. But when you come to, to terms with and embrace the reality that his conquering sin and death and hell and the grave ensures that you too will face that and conquer it, as he comes to say at the end of this chapter, then you can live boldly. Bold I approach the eternal throne. Right? Can it be that I should gain an interest? And so, Paul begins this chapter by saying, I want to remind you, verse 1, 
of the gospel I preach to you, you received in which you're standing. You received the gospel of Paul, and we're going we're to look at what he says it is. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then we receive that. That is how we stand. That is our footing. That is our footing. I hope it's built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. In other words, I don't lean on anything, no matter how pleasant it may be. But wholly, completely trust in Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. Which Christ? The crucified, resurrected, ascended, returning Jesus Christ. He says in verse 11, whether then it's I or they, so we preach and so you believe. This is the message. I want us to unfold this, this section under, under five, uh, what, we, what some have called testimonies, uh, that Paul sets forward demonstrating the fact of the resurrection of Jesus and why they too should have reason to hope if they're followers of Christ that they too will experience resurrection. First of all, the testimony of the church, verses 1 and 2. Then the testimony of the scriptures, verses 3 and 4. And the testimony of the eyewitnesses, verses 5 to 7. The testimony of Paul himself, as he calls himself, one born out of due season. Then the testimony of the common message itself, verse 11. So let's, let's begin today looking at the testimony of the church, verses 1 and 2. He says in verses 1 and 2, I want to remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand, right? And by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Well, he talks about being saved. We've talked about this in the past. As you move into the experience of salvation, which we call it salvation in three tenses, there is justification. Justification says, I have been saved from the penalty of sin. No longer under condemnation. If I've trusted in Jesus Christ, as my Lord and Savior, if I've repented of my sin and confessed Christ as Lord, then I have been saved from the penalty of sin. Justification is a one-time event. It's full. It's finished. It's complete. But there's a sense in which I am being saved, and that's sanctification. If I have been saved from the, from the penalty of sin, justification, I am being saved from the power of sin. No matter how long you've been a follower of Jesus Christ, how long you've been a Christian, you can look back and see growth. The only people who don't see growth is dead people. Right? If you're a Christian, you're growing. I am being saved from the power of sin. Do an inventory sometime. Look back on your life. And say, you know, there was a time in my life when this seemed to have a real grip on me. Thank God, by His grace, as the Spirit has strengthened me, as I've fed upon His Word and I've grown, that, that issue is being slain. Oh, there's always going to be other issues that will raise up you have to take on because I am being saved from the power of sin. But there's this future tense of salvation. I shall be saved from the very presence of sin. There's a day coming. We'll be taken by God's grace to heaven, either one by one, or when he returns and collects all of his people to go with him to heaven. And that happens in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, you'll be before your Savior in the presence of Jesus. Be made like him, seeing him as he is. And in that place, no sinful choices. You walk out of these doors today. In fact, right now while I'm preaching, some of you are facing sinful choices. That is, am I going to listen to what the preacher is saying or am I going to occupy myself? There are digital devices. They're easy to slip out and you can look at and, and look through and, and, and insult God by sitting, you know. I would say to somebody, look, you're going to look at your phones and look at your little digital things. Go on outside. Don't even make a pretense of it. It's the Word of God being preached here. You can show me something more important going on and I'll sit down and you can bring that up here. We'll go. Temptation's facing you right now. Let your mind wander. Temptation. But let's move beyond that. You walk out these doors, sinful choices face you. How are you going to spend your time? How are you going to spend the Lord's day? What you're going to yield to and, and give in to? You're going to fight against. In heaven, none of those things. It's all gone. It's all gone. Removed. But plus, you're not even tempted anymore. You're glory. I will be saved. I shall be saved from the very presence of sin so that 
so that sin is gone. It's not even a choice for me. Isn't that a wonderful thought? The day that will come when no matter what I think, there's no possibility of sin mixing in it. No matter what I do, it will not be mixed with sin. No matter what's set before me, it will not, it will not constitute a temptation to sin. That's salvation in its tenses. I think that's what Paul says, by which you're being saved. But he gives this caveat. If you hold fast to the word I have preached to you, this is going to be his uh, complaint. That if you took all the gospel, we're clinging tenaciously to all the gospel I preached to you, then you're going to stand. You're going to withstand. You won't be tossed about by every wind of doctrine. You won't lose your footing because your feet will be shed with the gospel of peace, as Paul says in Ephesians 6. Hold fast. Brothers and sisters, I submit to you, it's easy, too easy, as we move along life's journey. Whereas initially when we were first brought to faith in Christ and we're stunned and overwhelmed and amazed, Amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, would die for me and we would cling tenaciously to the cross and and want no other. Over time, because we live in a fallen world, we have remaining sin. We have an enemy of our souls who will say, you don't have to have a death grip on the cross. Relax. Relax. Get up. Take a breath. Don't be so intense. We're not holding fast. We're not intensely, earnestly desiring to be more like Jesus. We, we figure we've, already, we've got all that settled already. The preacher said, I have been saved from the penalty of sin, so that's, that's behind me. That's why we sing the world behind me, cross before me. We never get it out of our view while we're on this earth's journey. Paul says, if you hold fast. You hold fast to the word I preach to you. Turn loose. You know something? We ought to know, have a confidence in all the doctrines of Scripture. Brother and sister, let me say to you, we should never think we can learn a doctrine that will make us think less cross, resurrected of Jesus. Every biblical truth rightly learned rightly received, simply makes larger the cross of Jesus Christ, makes more hopeful the empty tomb of Jesus Christ. Anything that obscures that from you, that you think you've found in Scripture, one of two things, you're not reading it right, or you've put something there that's not there. The word I preach to you. He could say that I've not shunned Preach to you the whole counsel of God. He told that to the Ephesian elders in that. The whole counsel of God. We ought to want to gobble it all up. Feed on it. Grow, grow by it. But evidence of growth that the cross and resurrection, the death coming back to life of Jesus Christ, looms larger, larger, larger. And I plead with you today, if you've been studying something that's made the cross resurrection of Jesus Christ seemed to be in your rearview mirror. Put it down. Run back to the cross. Fall in love again with Jesus all over. And made that reality look large. Because he goes on to say, unless you believed in vain. Yes, there is the possibility. Coming face to face with the gospel. He's going to declare here in a few minutes. And them. Face to face with the gospel, acknowledging Jesus indeed was who he said he was. That he died, the sin bearing substitute, taking my sin upon himself, taking your sin upon himself. That he endured the wrath of God for that. God poured out his wrath upon him so much so that he would cry out from the cross, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? That he really did die that he satisfied God's divine justice by his suffering and death in our place, that he really was put in a tomb dead, that he really did come out of the grave three days later alive again. It's, it's possible to encounter every one of those truths 
to nod to them, to acknowledge the reality of them, to recognize the truthfulness of them, and believe in vain. Remember, Paul said in Romans, it's with the heart. When the gospel reaches the heart, and the evidence of that comes out of the mouth, there's transformation. There's transformation. He's basically saying to these Corinthians, and he said it several times through this letter, you need to hear what I said to you and take it all, brace it, inculcate it, live by it. If you don't, then you have none what I said to you. Gives this little caveat here, which if you're in the Corinthian church and this letter's being read, I know it didn't take two, two years to read the letter. Bear with me here. I'm slow. Paul was much faster than I. You hear that, less you believed pain. What James refers to as saying faith. He doesn't use that term, but that's the essence of it. You say you believe in God. The demons believe and tremble. Saying faith. Saving faith works from the inside out. The metamorphosis Paul speaks of in Romans 12. Not being conformed to this world, but keep on being metamorphosed, transformed by the renewing of the mind. We may prove that this gospel powerfully. And so, that's his first witness. He challenges them with something that's very sobering, I would think. The second thing I want us to see into here is the testimony of the Scripture. Look at verses 3 and 4. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. What he's telling them here is, if you, if you list the importance of the things that I taught you while I was there, and if you, we've said to you before, if you want to get an idea of what Paul taught when he went into a church. The letter to Romans is our best measure because he had not been to Rome when he writes that letter. Many of these letters he writes back to churches he founded. He hadn't been to Rome. So when you read through Romans, you get an idea of what Paul would emphasize when he came in. He emphasized depravity. He emphasized justification by faith. He emphasized that the righteousness of God was our hope, our only hope, and our faith placed in that. He emphasizes communion with God. He emphasizes the battle of remaining sin, the confidence that in chapter 8 that uh, there is now therefore no condemnation, and at the end there can be no separation. He emphasizes God's, God's working and calling and being sure to bring his people to faith in Christ. He challenges in very practical terms in chapters 12 and following. So if you want to understand, have an idea, well, what did Paul preach? I'd say read through Romans. You have the best, best hope of understanding what the message was that he carried. And so he says here, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. So he doesn't want them to think that this is original of Paul. Paul had people traveling all behind him. When he would go in somewhere to start a church, these Judaizers would come in. Well, you know, Paul says this, but he really doesn't mean that. And Paul, doesn't, Paul says, I received this. This is not original with me. What I declared to you there was something been revealed to me by Jesus Christ himself. And here it is. Here's the gospel. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. Everything that happened to Jesus happened as a result of the prophetic word in the Old Testament. Everything. We studied about the life of Joseph this morning in our Bible study. Wow. Wow. There's a guy, if anybody ever had the right to say, I don't deserve any of this, Joseph did. That's not how he lived. That's not how he responded to it. Everything that happened in Jesus' life was accordance with the Scriptures. He died. Paul says he didn't just die on the cross. He died for, he died on behalf of our sins. He died because of our sins. 
Greek professors in seminary talking about these prepositions. He says, if, if, you, if someone says this fellow was hanged for stealing horses, he was hanged because horses had been stolen. Horse thing. Jesus died for our sins because of our sins caused his death. It wasn't cruel action by the Romans, though it was cruel. But it wasn't just that. It wasn't misguided actions by the Sanhedrin. It was that, but it, just, it wasn't just that. It was all in accordance with the prophecy. Psalm 22 opens up, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Centuries before, psalmist utters the very words Jesus would utter on the cross. Isaiah, called the evangelical prophet. Isaiah 53, one of the most moving passages. Wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity. Chastisement that resulted in our peace was placed upon him by his stripes. Healed. Christ died for our sins. Here's the question. He died for sinners. The question is, did he die for you? What do you mean, preacher? Have you not trusted in him? Have you not placed your faith in him? Have you not come to the point where you said, Lord, I'm a sinner. I long for the saving work of Jesus Christ to be applied to my life by the Holy Spirit. If you're not having those kind of conversations and desire, you're not, you have no confidence he died for you. You won't stand in the judgment before God, before he cast you into hell and say, what? But Jesus died for me. Here's the evidence that he died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, which says he really died. The governor, former governor of Louisiana, years ago, decades ago, when I was there pastoring, he was a crook. He was, he was the son of a, a, of a, a get what denomination. Anyway, so he, he had preached some himself, uh, but he finally decided, that he, Easter time, as I recall, and he said, you know, I know... The Bible says, and all he said, but I really have concluded that Jesus swooned. That he just, he didn't really die on the cross. He, he passed out. And who wouldn't have passed out given all the stuff that he faced? And they took him down, and he, and he was revived later on. Heretic. Heretic. No hope of salvation for a person who would make such a statement. Scripture says he was buried. You bury dead people. And he was raised. On the third day, in accordance with the scriptures, just as just as the Old Testament said would happen, Prophet Jonah, Jesus cited that and said, just as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish three days, three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth. As one preacher said that I heard years ago, I admired this so much. An African American preacher, he said, they buried him. He didn't need to have his own tomb because he wasn't going to be there very long. A borrowed tomb fit him just fine. He was raised dead, according to the Scriptures. There is the gospel. You believe all of it or none of it has effect for you. He died for your sin. He really died. On that cross, beyond the capacity of the naked eye to see, he didn't cry out, Romans, Romans, why are you torturing me like this? He didn't cry out, Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin, how could you lose your way so thoroughly as to offer me up for this? He cried out, my God, my God, why have you done this? Not because he didn't know. Because the suffering was... Unbelievable, unimaginable. There he died. Look to the cross today, sinner. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ here, look to the cross. That's where your hope is. Look to the empty tomb. That's where your hope is. It's not in how well you perform, how much you know, how right you live. It's in the work of Jesus Christ. There he hung. 
When he said it is finished, it's a, uh, it's a three-syllable word in the Greek. And in order to translate it, to give it its force, it has been and stands accomplished. Redemption accomplished at the cross. Jesus Christ didn't make salvation possible at the cross. He says he accomplished salvation at the cross. He was buried. God, the eternal God. Where does God come from? The mind boggling always been. And the Son, the second person, has always been. That person, the Trinity, dies. Takes your breath away when you contemplate. Then he was raised back to life. That reality, that infallible truth, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, means for you and me that as we trust in Him while we live in this earth, commit our lives to Him as a follower of Jesus, that not even the worst enemy can defeat us. That means for you and me that death is just a vehicle us to heaven. It holds no power. We're going to get to the end of the 15th chapter. Paul's going to mock death. Where's your sting? Where's your victory? Because you see, he knows. Jesus hung on the cross. The devil thought he saw his opportunity and like a, like a wicked serpent that he is, sunk his fangs into Jesus to finish him off and get him out of the way. What he didn't realize was in doing that, that the very demonic poisoning of, would be drained out of him. He would become powerless. Powerless. The power he held was over death, and Jesus took that away from him. So that now, death has no victory over us. The grave is not the final place for us. Hell, not even on our bucket list of destination. That's the gospel. Raised three days later, conquering sin and death and hell. Is that the gospel you? Is that the gospel you're clinging to? The only gospel there is. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. That is the, the crucified, buried, risen Christ. All other ground. Is sinking sand. When the winds blow, a house built on anything other than the foundation of Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection will be blown away. My hope today, my desire today, is that you, many of you here, placed your faith and your hope in Jesus Christ, in this gospel, that you're living by grace through faith, rejoicing in such love shown by such a Savior, by such a God. My concern is, as Paul said to a church that he started, lest you believed in vain. It's always a concern of a pastor, lest you believe. And then for those who make no pretense of believing, horrible to come. So I appeal to you as we close today, come to Jesus Christ. Cast your all upon him. Repent of your sin in the face of his beauty and holiness. Give your life to the one who gave his life for you. Follow him all the days of your life. His disciple, he, your Lord. The gospel, Paul says it's the first, the most important. Everything else, the distant second. Let's pray. Your Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We bow before you today in Jesus' name. We thank you for the gospel. We, we feel with Paul the concern that he has for, for some of those in Corinth who had been led to reject the prospect of their own resurrection, even as they said they believed that Jesus raised from the Oh, God, help us. Help us to get the whole thing right. 
And help us to live being transformed by this powerful gospel. Never to be the same. Growing, conforming to the image of Jesus. More like Him. Thinking more like Him. Speaking more like Him. Acting more like Him. Longing to be like Him. Looking forward to the day when we shall see Him and be like Him. Oh, God. Have mercy upon those of us who claim to be followers of Christ that it would not be true of any here that we have believed, but believed in vain. And yet, for those who are not yet followers of Christ, who hang around religious things, who, who sit through worship times, bored stiff, oh God, awaken them, shake them from death to life, they might see the beauty of our Savior. Behold the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. See their utter sinfulness and hopelessness and cast their all upon him. Salvation. We ask this in the name of the one who died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, the one who was buried in a borrowed tomb, the one who came out of the tomb three days later alive, even Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.